Are you ready, viewers? Aye, aye, Dave. I can hear you. Aye, aye, Dave. Oh. <coughs> SpongeBob SquarePants is the naive and innocent little kitchen sponge who lives in a pineapple under the sea. Based on a character conceived by Steven Hillenburg in 1984, but introduced to the world in his own self-titled series on Nickelodeon in 1999, SpongeBob quickly took the world by storm, generating a multi-billion dollar franchise in the space of only a few years. Named the ninth greatest cartoon character of all time by TV Guide in 2002, beating out the likes of Bart Simpson, Tom and Jerry, Betty Boop, Scooby-Doo, Daffy Duck and and even Mickey Mouse, only three years after his debut, SpongeBob had become an iconic staple of animated film and pop culture. Over the years, SpongeBob's popularity has not declined, though many argue that the quality of his appearances has ebbed and flowed. In 2020, SpongeBob turns 21 years old, and to celebrate, I will trace his entire evolution right from 1999 to now. To do so, we will look at the inception and development of his series, spotlighting changes made in his design and personality, and the franchise's tonal and narrative shifts prevalent across over two decades of episodes and feature films. In this edition of Cartoon Evolution. <laughs> Flashback. This cartoon evolution doesn't start in the usual of places. It doesn't start in 1920s Hollywood or 1940s New York. It doesn't even start on mainland Earth, but in another land under the sea. Not only the home to some of the world's most curious and majestic animals, but the playground of Jacques Cousteau, famed French scientist, explorer, and conservationist, and filmmaker. Ah, uh, hold on a second, I put the wrong tape in. A few moments later. Okay then, where was I? Land under the sea, home to animals in the playground of Jacques Cousteau. Famed French scientist, explorer, conservationist and filmmaker. That's better. Cousteau was best known for his scores of groundbreaking marine biology and biodiversity documentaries of the 1950s, 60s and 70s. Back up on the surface, on the opposite side of the globe, in California, an eight-year-old boy named Steven Hillenburg was captivated with Cousteau's films. It was like looking at another planet, he'd say. It's just a place that is unlike anywhere on the planet, and there's unexplored areas and animals and plants we don't even know about still. As a keen observer, Hillenburg not only found himself fascinated with marine biology, but also with art and painting. However, it was his love of the ocean that ultimately dominated his earliest dreams, believing that if he studied art, he'd struggle to make a living, deciding instead to keep his art his passion and hobby. Later. Having graduated university in 1984 with a degree in natural resource planning and interpretation with a focus on marine resources, Hillenburg eventually found himself working his dream job at the Orange County Marine Institute, where he spent three years teaching marine science. Still, with a keen passion for art, he soon gained reputation as the staff artist. His boss suggested he write a comic to help explain the life of organisms living in tide pools in an entertaining way. And in Inspired by lowbrow humour publications like Mad Magazine and comic artists such as Robert Crumb, he got to work on The Intertidal Zone. The comic was set in an intertidal zone, the area where ocean meets land, and presented a number of wild, wacky and zany sea life inhabitants, including an anthropomorphic sea sponge wearing sunglasses called Bob the Sponge. Proving popular with his students, Hillenburg attempted to shop the intertidal zone around for publication. While publishers liked the comic, its educational nature made many believe that it wouldn't sell, so Hillenburg shelved the whole thing. However, no longer able to deny his immense love for art, he left the Marine Institute to follow his passion, and in 1989 enrolled in the California Institute of the Arts Master's Program for Experimental Animation. Hillenburg noted at the time, Changing careers like that is scary, but the irony is that animation is a pretty healthy career right now, and science education is more of a struggle. Much 
Later. Soon after graduating from CalArts in 1992, Hillenburg met animator Joe Murray, who'd recently sold a series to Nickelodeon called Rocco's Modern Life. Impressed with Hillenburg's short thesis film Wormholes, Murray asked him to join his blossoming team as a writer, story artist and director. Hillenburg worked on Rocco for its entire three-year run, promoted to series creative director in the fourth and final season as Murray stepped down from responsibilities. Rocco was a learning ground for Hillenburg and towards the end of the show's run, he was encouraged to pitch his own series based on the intertidal zone. Initially, he was reluctant, feeling no desire to produce a show of his own because of the stresses that came along with it. However, when working on Rocco episode Fish and Chumps, he found a way to fuse and synthesize his two passions and excited at the possibilities, jumped at the opportunity to develop his own C-set series. Much like in Intertidal Zone, Hillenburg decided against focusing on often featured sea creatures, instead wanting to showcase all the bizarre animals that exist in the tide pool, like starfish, snails, crabs and sponges, the latter of which he chose as his lead character. Hillenburg noted that a sea sponge was one of the most unlikely characters you might choose, because it's a funny animal, a strange one. Initially, Hillenburg began by drawing biologically correct natural sponges, as he'd say, amorphous shapes, blobs, similar to Bob the Sponge in Intertidal Zone. Soon enough though, he realised this idea didn't translate very well into cartoon language, and instead settled on what he believed would be more recognisable and funnier to audiences, a kitchen sponge, giving him the name Sponge Boy. In developing the personality of Sponge Boy, Hillenburg looked to many of his childhood heroes, blending the slapstick comedic stylings of Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton, the charm and quick wit of Laurel and Hardy, the eccentricity and youthfulness of Pee Wee Herman, and the naivete of Jerry Lewis, creating a character that he'd describe as innocent, funny, nerdy, squeaky clean, well-meaning and kind of an oddball. One that would, in the words of animation historian Jerry Beck, unhinge everyone around him as he tries to soak up life's lessons. Hillenburg surrounded Sponge Boy with a collection of equally peculiar and offbeat characters, entitled his program Sponge Boy Ahoy. He pulled together a team consisting mostly of artists from Rocco to produce the pilot Help Wanted, and hired voice artist Tom Kenny, who'd voiced Heifer on Rocco, to provide the voice of Sponge Boy. Because there was an existing trademark on the name Sponge Boy, both an obscure character from Flaming Carrot Comics and a cleaning product, Hillenburg returned to the name of his original sponge in the intertidal zone, Bob. Wanting to retain the word sponge in case people confused Bob for a cheese man, Sponge Boy was rechristened SpongeBob. In looking for a last name, Hillenburg chose SquarePants. After hearing Kenny remark, Boy, look at this sponge in SquarePants, upon seeing a drawing of the character for the first time. Hillenburg said, I thought it was the most ridiculous last name he could have. It made me laugh thinking about all those parents who would be absolutely baffled by their kids saying SpongeBob SquarePants. When he pitched the program to Nickelodeon, executives were initially confused, with Albie Haish, former president of entertainment, saying they found it so different to any other animated series, which at the time were mostly over-the-top, low-brow, gross-out buddy comedies. Russell Hicks, president of content development and production, further noted it caught everyone's attention in the way it kind of broke our mould. Hage further said that there was non-stop laughter during the pitch. With a touch of trepidation, Nickelodeon put their full trust and confidence in Hillenburg and ordered SpongeBob SquarePants to series. And the rest, as they say, is history. End of flashback. Well, with uh, 15 minutes of this episode left, it would be remiss of me not to go over that history. So here we go. Debuting in 1999, SpongeBob SquarePants, unlike many of the most iconic programs, took a couple of years to take the world by storm, though eventually became a global phenomenon and a merchandising juggernaut. Nickelodeon and Hillenburg himself were blindsided by the immense popularity of the character, saying, I'm not sure there was a lot of confidence in the idea. You have to imagine you write a show about a sponge and you think that maybe a few people will think it is funny, some college students, but it takes off. It is 
truly shocking. I figured we'd have a cult following for this weird little show. It still is a weird little show, it just got big. It's a big, weird little show. Before long, Spongebob had become, as Beck calls him, a symbol signature character for Nickelodeon, and the series their highest rated, most widely distributed and most lucrative ever. Undeniably one of the biggest television shows in history. Robert Thompson, professor of television at Syracuse University, would even go as far as saying, this crazy kitchen sponge in a tie and a pair of private school shorts has managed to penetrate the culture in a way that very very, very few other things have done. Beck attributes a large part of Spongebob's success to the way the program throws back to the classic animations of the golden era, with characters such as Woody Woodpecker, Popeye and Bugs Bunny all clear inspirations, and pinpoints Spongebob's use of squash and stretch animation techniques as an enormous part of his comedic allure, noting that he could be pulled and squeezed and flattened like a pancake, saying they can do anything with him, things that haven't been done in decades. Unique elements such as live action cutaways and fourth wall breaks, which Hillenburg had wanted to try on Rocco but eventually repurposed for Spongebob, also gave the show an incredibly unique edge. However, beneath all the goofy and zany antics, the show's heartfelt and meaningful nature and Spongebob's innocent personality charmed not only the children but the adults as well. The way in which he bounced off the more dim-witted and insatiable characters around him and constantly found himself unwitting Fittingly entangled in sticky situations and harebrained schemes was particularly appealing. It was a series that was far more than it seemed on the surface, a one of a kind cartoon that audiences connected with unlike any other of the era. However, many fans will tell you that the golden age of Spongebob Squarepants was somewhat short lived, with the character and his series undergoing a number of changes and evolutions that are not often held in fond regard. What follows is a brief construction montage. The first evolution of Spongebob was a minor one, which saw the shift from the traditional cell animated workflow of the first season to the partly digital workflow of the second. Characters were still hand drawn, but the inking and painting was all done on computers. The switch between seasons is noticeably different. In contrast, the first season appeared with muted colours, raw animation and rougher line work, while the second was not only brighter, but quite a lot cleaner. Spongebob himself became rounder and was given bigger eyes in an effort to make him slightly cuter. These changes would continue into the third season where now his pupils were made larger and his coat even brighter. Following the third season, Hillenburg felt that the show was on its last leg, saying, We have 60 episodes and that is probably as many as Nickelodeon really needs, noting that he always looked at that as a typical run for an animated show. Wanting to take Spongebob out with a bang, he envisioned the series Swan Song as a feature length theatrical film. Nickelodeon allowed Hillenburg to put the series on hiatus so he and his team could focus on the Spongebob Squarepants movie, which was released in 2004. Here, Spongebob's style took another turn. With the grander scope of a feature film and its larger budget, the character and his world took on a big, bold and punchy look, brighter and more vibrant than ever before. Spongebob's design was made a lot more angular, leading to a less fluid, more rigid animation style. As Hillenburg's last hurrah, the Spongebob Squarepants movie was an incredible hit for fans, totally encapsulating the style and heart of the series. It was the perfect way for it to come to an end, which Hillenburg truly believed it was, saying at the time, I think Nickelodeon respect that my contribution is important. I think they would want to maintain the original concept and quality. But boy, was he wrong. Nickelodeon returned Spongebob to the airwaves for a fourth season the following year, now with Paul Tippett at the helm and Hillenburg simply serving as executive producer. With many of Hillenburg's team of writers following him out, the show was almost completely overhauled. With a new production team on board, captained mostly by executives who didn't quite get the crux of the show, Spongebob took an enormous dive into the deep depths of the ocean. Over the following season, Spongebob saw a number of minor design changes. Season Four saw him gain larger pupils, season 5 saw his outlines made thicker, season 6 saw his nose made bigger, and season 8 saw a slight lowering of his face and a considerable shrinkage of his eyes, all part of an effort to give him a smaller, more compact, cuter appearance.
appearance. The show's aesthetics began to shift as well, moving to a fully CG workflow in Season 5, with animation now being wholly produced on Wacom tablets, furthering the stiff, limited style of the series. A full HD workflow was further implemented in Season 9, the first season to be presented in 16-9 widescreen. None of the design changes, however, were overwhelmingly noticeable unless scrutinised with a fine tooth comb. Kinda like what I'm doing now, but hey! That's my job, okay? But what was highly evident was a shift in the series' overall stylistics and humour and in the personalities of the characters. SpongeBob and his friends' personalities and their animation grew exponentially more stylized and overblown following Hillenburg's departure. In an effort by executives to keep the show fresh and aimed at a younger demographic, SpongeBob began to shift course away from its original style, straying from uncharted waters of originality back towards the old habits of the zanier, screwball, gross-out style of the 1990s Nicktoons. SpongeBob's personality was totally stripped back and exaggerated, his small character quirks gradually blown up to the point where they totally engulfed his very being. The subtext of his personality became its focus. SpongeBob was no longer innocent and naive, but reckless and stupid. Along with the over-exaggeration of his personality also came an over-expressiveness in his animation, totally changing the core appeal of the character. SpongeBob's friends in Bikini Bottom also saw these changes. Patrick became dumber and dumber, Mr. Krabs became greedier and greedier, and Squidward became more and more arrogant, losing all redeemable qualities. The process that the series characters went through has been dubbed Flanderization, a term named after the Simpsons' Ned Flanders, whose character was gradually embellished more and more throughout the course of the series' three-decade run. Speaking on the success of Spongebob, Beck noted, What makes great cartoon characters is a creator who has a strong vision for what his character is, and Steve Hillenburg was really the guiding light. And it's incredibly clear, without that guiding light, the series had lost its way, and in fact, fans of Spongebob consider this period to be the show's lowest point. Thankfully, it was somewhat short-lived and salvageable. All it took was the return of Hillenburg, which he did to write the story for and oversee the production of the second Spongebob movie, Sponge Out of Water, released in 2015, midway through the show's ninth season. With Hillenburg's import, Sponge Out of Water returned a certain spark and charm to Spongebob and his his world. SpongeBob himself saw a design overhaul, returning him to a shapelier, rounder, smoother appearance, much like in the earlier seasons. The more outlandish aspects of recent seasons were toned down drastically, and the humour once again regained its age-defying innocence. Glimmers of what made SpongeBob so special in the first place were finally returning to the surface. Sponge Out of Water grossed almost $100 million in profit at the box office, becoming the second highest-grossing film based on an animated TV series behind only The Simpsons movie. Following the film, Hillenburg returned to a more creative role in the series from mid-ninth season onward. The following seasons managed to regain Sponge Out of Water's revived style and are held in higher regard by longtime fans of the series. In November of 2018, after a short battle with motor neuron disease, Hillenburg passed away at the age of 57. At his time of death, he was still actively working on SpongeBob, with the most recent season 12 being the final he was involved in. While SpongeBob's story somewhat ends here for now, we couldn't close this video without noting some of the more unique designs SpongeBob has appeared in over the years. 2009's SpongeBob's Truth or Square, a 10th anniversary TV special, featured a stop motion animation opening produced by Screen Novelties, featuring SpongeBob in a physical form for the very first time. 2012 season 8 episode It's a SpongeBob Christmas was the first to be produced entirely in stop motion. Here, SpongeBob Bob appeared not made from a sponge, but a piece of yellow foam. The special was inspired by the classic Rankin and Bass TV Christmas specials, with its design and narrative style clearly influenced. While smack bang in the series' lowest period, it is viewed fondly by fans, with one of the highest IMDb ratings between seasons 3 and 9. 
In 2017's Season 11 Halloween special, The Legend of Bukini Bottom, the stop motion format was used once again. In 2013, The Great Jelly Rescue, a 4D attraction at Nickelodeon Family Suites in Orlando, SpongeBob and Friends appeared in 3D computer animation for the very first time. While in 2015's The SpongeBob Movie Sponge Out of Water, they again appeared in the style during a brief CG live action hybrid sequence. The film's trailers, however, made heavy use of this footage and led audiences to believe that a majority of the film would be in the style. The idea to realise the characters in CGI was, according to then CEO and President of Viacom, Philippe Dowman, to refresh and give another boost to the characters. During this sequence, SpongeBob and Co are also depicted in highly muscular humanoid designs. 2019's Season 12 20th Anniversary Special SpongeBob's Big Birthday Blowout is also notable for being the only time the voice cast of the series have appeared depicting live action versions of their characters. Here, Kenny appears as Jim Bob, a highly awkward and erratic burger chef at the Trusty Slab restaurant. Though the SpongeBob characters had already appeared in a live action form when a Broadway show based on the series launched in 2016. Several song filled hours later. While the future of the Spongebob series is unknown beyond its announced 13th season, which will only include 13 episodes, half the usual amount, there are a number of unique projects in the pipeline. Intended for theatrical release in mid-2020 before the pandemic sent the world down the drain, Spongebob's third movie, Sponge on the Run, will instead release in early 2021 on CBS's all-access streaming service and internationally on Netflix. The film makes use of CG animation and unlike Sponge Out of Water, will utilise it throughout its entire length, though the usual live-action hybrid sequences will also be featured. The film seems to be inspired by the early classic Spongebob episodes, with trailers depicting an exciting buddy picture that seems to retain the heart and innocence of the original series. Following its release, Nickelodeon will launch CG animated spin-off series Camp Coral, SpongeBob's Under Years, following the adventures of a 10-year-old SpongeBob at the Camp Coral Summer Camp, flashbacks to which will be seen in Sponge on the Run. Another series said to be in production is a Squidward spin-off, which Nickelodeon are producing exclusively for Netflix under their reported $200 million distribution and licensing deal, which will see the network create a number of exclusive series for the streamer based on their existing characters. Likewise, it's been reported that Patrick will also headline his own program, which will take on the form of a late-night talk show. It's set to be 13 episodes long and will likely launch on Nickelodeon sometime in 2021, with voice recording apparently already underway. News of these spin-offs will likely come with mixed reception, given that Hillenburg was vehemently against producing such series, most notably saying that he believed a Patrick spin-off would be too much. <laughs> SpongeBob is a character who has seemingly avoided the fate of many cartoons who long outlasted their prime and drowned in their own imploding success. He's one who sank to the deepest, darkest recesses of the sea, yet sprung back to life with a little help from his creator. In the post hillenburg era, however, it's unknown what shape or quality the series will take. With a shortened 13th season, it's not unreasonable to consider that the end of our favourite little sponge may be nigh. Though with his continued popularity and the new Nick Netflix deal, it's probably unlikely. Me personally, I believe there's always a place for these characters to continually thrive and survive in the right hands. SpongeBob isn't dated just yet. He's a character as relevant as ever. If looked after well, I think he has a long, long life ahead of him. I guess only Maritime will tell. <laughs> oh gosh, that was a bad one. And on that note, it's over to you. What is your personal favourite Spongebob episode, season, movie or overall appearance? Fire away in the comments below and let me know your thoughts. If this is your first time viewing one of my videos and you'd like to see more like it in the future, then please don't forget to hit that big old subscribe button up on your screen, as well as that like button down below for that little extra support. Also don't forget to check me out on social media and please consider supporting me over on Patreon. Thanks for watching and have a fantastic day.